few housekeeping items first. There is a neighbor that is drilling and sawing timber. I will do my absolute best. If, if you heard that then, that's what I'm gonna do my absolute best to cut out. And if that happens in the video, I will try and redo that bit to avoid it. If you see a pile of jump cuts happen very quickly in the video, you'll know why. There is also a temperature sensor or thermometer up here uh, that's 28.2 degrees at the moment. Uh, I've angled it there, so uh, maybe once every now and then I will allude to the temperature visually. I, I won't do it um, in voice. So without further ado, this is the U110, possibly. That's a deadly cheap mini ITX case made for just about everything. The product page I purchased this from on Amazon totes this as suitable for applications like desktop PCs, HD PCs, commercial systems for hotel check-in points, digital signage, advertising machines, and self-service terminals. Those last few stand out, and yes, it's perfectly reasonable to bottle this whole page down to, it's probably just a pile of selling points that have been retranslated from Chinese to English and back three times over. The price will be an indication of that in a second, since you can get this under many other names. But I think several design decisions lead me to think all of those use cases are valid. And yes, that could be valid for a lot of things. Anyway, outside of its design, I bought it for under £27, which is roughly $32. The cheapest possible ITX case you can get your hands on from a well-known manufacturer, that this isn't from a well-known manufacturer, is the Thermaltake Core V1, and that's... $53, but that's a 22 litre case and this one's 6 litres. Now, to be fair, other super compact ITX cases exist and cheap ones at that, and from companies you might have heard of, such as the 6.7 litre Geek A31 V2 for $50, or the 7.1 litre Silverstone ML06B for $60, but on the other hand, let's not forget there are some horrendously expensive tiny ITX cases out there, like the 7.1 litre, roughly $250. As far as I can tell, Laser 3D LZ7V1, and the very well-known Dan Cases A4, which volumes in at 7.6 litres for $200. But then again, let's not cast too much shade since you'll find more options and quality in those last two at least, not to mention compatibility. This one, on the other hand, gets really interesting and also really expensive. So without further ado, it's only $32, but it, it does get really expensive. Without further ado, let's check this thing out. The packaging for such a cheap unit is great. The box itself has a carry handle and the case itself is wrapped in relatively thick plastic well, plastic bag, and bookended by closed cell foam, which you don't typically find in cases any cheaper than $100. As for the case itself, once the cat's out of the bag, it's extremely light. I mean, it was always light before, but I wanted a segue into its construction, which is nearly entirely aluminium, apart from like the screws and stuff, and some plates at the back. Anyway, despite how cheap this thing is, it's not lacking style. Well, it's not lacking a style. Whether you like it is completely down to you, but I think it looks interesting in a subtle way. The front panel is very basic, nothing but the front IO is on show, which consists of a power button and LED up top, and two USB 3.0 ports to the base. I'm quite surprised they're not USB 2 ports, but I think I'm failing to account for how far we've come from those days. Still only $32. Anyway, up top we've got a section of vents roughly 75 millimeters wide and 80 millimeters deep. It's not really a position for a fan since there's only 16 millimeters of clearance to the central motherboard tray and the slot spacing is all wrong. So stock, this is for passive exhaust ventilation purposes only, as far as I can tell. Unfortunately, there isn't an instruction manual in sight to clarify the design intent. In more intricately designed cases, you'd get a filter up here to at least prevent dust from settling in your system from your room. But this isn't intricately designed, it's more of a broad strokes affair. The rear of the case is where it's all going on, the junk is in the trunk as it were. We've got the rear I.O. position for the ITX board, two-piece express slots with removable slot covers that are steel and solid as hell, especially for a cheap case, not something you get in 
other cheap cases, although you don't get a lot of stuff in this that you do in others, so let's gloss over that. If you know what the cutouts are for specifically, I'd really appreciate a comment in the comments section. I'm assuming they conform to a standardized layout of sorts. But moving on, the power supply position, power supply unit position is in the bottom. And if you think that's a weird looking power supply unit hole, even for a small SFX power supply unit, common in many small ITX cases, you're right. And we'll get onto that in the power supply unit section. It's really interesting, at least to me. The side panels each have roughly 90 by 130 millimeters of intake vent slots for your CPU cooler and graphics card. And the base is a completely sealed plane of aluminum. So let's get inside and build a system in this thing and get testing. Removing the panels is a little awkward. After removing the two screws for each side panel located at the rear of the case, the panels need encouraging backwards before they become free from the chassis. There aren't any handles or tabs or loops to grip onto this to achieve your removed panel state. So you just gotta kind of figure it out. Once they're off, we can see that as much as they seem to mirror as much as they seem to be mirror images or symmetrical, they're very slightly different. I'm assuming this is to prevent you from replacing the wrong panel on the wrong side, which is a nice touch. And overall, the retention mechanism is quite strong. Panels off, let's assess the filters. Fan and radiator support next, and... Onto the power supply and install, and this is the most important part to understand as far as I'm concerned. Actually, there are about five things you really need to know before pulling the trigger on this case. Not that it's a risky pull of the trigger, it is only like $32, 27-ish pounds, but people have different budgets, so let's not be too judgy. The normal go-to power supply unit size for compact ITX cases is the SFX power supply unit. This is the Corsair SF600, a, a pretty common range of SFX power supply units. It's a lot smaller than the most common ATX power supply units, which lends itself to being useful for compact builds. But that's not quite small enough for this case. This case requires you to acquire a flex ATX power supply unit, which is a lot smaller than an SFX power supply unit, about one third smaller and one quarter the size of a normal 160 millimeter long ATX power supply unit. This is 140 millimeters long, I think, particularly small. Naturally, this limits you in a couple of areas. You can get a 300 watt unit relatively easily for about 60 pounds in my area or about $100 on PC Part Picker US, but that's quite expensive for a 300 watt power supply unit. However, you can get a 600 watt flex ATX power supply unit, which are a lot more expensive at about 140 pounds or over $200 for a 600 watt power supply unit. But if, and a big if, you're thinking 600 watts can power a pretty powerful machine, I'd have to say, I agree, which I then closely follow up with, but did you know flex ATX power supply units are cooled by 40 millimeter maximum fans? This 300 watt unit is loud enough at idle and did prevent me from getting the system as a whole down to the 37.5 dBA target in the acoustic testing. So I can only imagine a more powerful system with a more powerful power supply unit all condensed into the same form factor would at least get a touch louder than this. Now, I got this case to review before fully understanding its requirements. That's just what I'm like sometimes. So I just had to make something work, which led me to buy this Silverstone FX350G for 65 pounds, which isn't the last component I needed to buy specifically for this build. It's not even the most expensive one. Now installing this thing into the case, it was challenging. This unit is 150 millimeters long, and since it's not a modular power supply unit, you have to deal with all the cables regardless of whether you need them. Not exactly easy considering the cables need to make a 90 degree sharp turn in just under 40 millimeters of leftover clearance. There was a fair amount of stress on the cables throughout this process, and I did end up having to remove the front USB ports to get enough clearance, which I replaced after the power supply unit was properly seated. 
which were then removed soon after. This process also presented the fragility of the anodized aluminium. So turning our attention to the pink anodized aluminium finish, also available in blue, which I think looks a lot cooler pun intended. We find the power supply knit install process left a few battle scars. Now those were caused before I removed the bracket to the rear of the power supply knit, which was making the installation a touch more challenging. Not much, but it's kind of the thing that caused some of the scratching. But outside of that, anodized aluminium isn't a very robust finish, and a good plastic would hold up better. At least marks in plastic don't show up as prominently as the color is consistent all the way through the material. The motherboard install was all standard, the IO fitted nicely, and there was plenty of space all around to position the board. Since this is an ITX only case, it makes sense that all the standoffs are fixed, but that does mean you need to be extra careful not to strip the threads. I, I think they're aluminium, so be really careful. If you're looking into your first build, the best advice I can give you is probably don't get this case, it's a pretty tough one, but other than that, the best advice I can give you for in installing a motherboard with the threads and screws is to go counterclockwise until you hear a click and then go clockwise until fully fastened. This more or less guarantees the thread of the screw and the post are aligned correctly. The same goes for spark plugs due to the softer aluminium blocks compared to the steel spark plug. As for the CPU cooler, well, you've got about 40 millimeters of room for a cooler. That's pretty much limiting you to about 26 options ranging from $10 to 60, which is plenty to find something suitable. That's limited further to seven options for AM4, two options for LGA1700, is that how people say 1700? And 12 options for LGA1200 and LGA115X sockets. But we all know there's only one option and that's the Noctua NHL9i or L9A for AMD boards. Just a joke, I'm sure there are other companies that make small coolers too. Three and a half inch drive wise, you've got a big choice to make here, and that's to go with either a three and a half inch drive or a PCI Express device like this graphics card. Now, that's not the end of the world since there are some great onboard GPU options around these days, which would be great for an HD PC, home theater PC, with some light gaming or just a budget gaming rig, uh, and, and a case like this being so budget friendly or budget oriented, it's, yeah, it would be a good option. But yes, unfortunately, the only position for a big drive in the same is, is the same position as the graphics card. But at least it explains what some of these holes in the motherboard tray are for. You'd think the rest would be for two and a half inch drives or something, but no, nothing quite lines up properly for two and a half inch drives here. Now you could just get a drill and make your own for some two and a half inch drives if you wanted more storage and a graphics card, but with nine millimeters of space between the motherboard tray and the graphics card, I'd also try and mod in a slim fan, uh, if you were even gonna do it at all, to give them the slightest chance of surviving the post. But uh, nine millimeters between the graphics card and the tray, seven millimeter thick, uh, two and a half inch drives are the slimmest ones you really can get. Um, I would avoid it entirely. Airflow is just so limited in this area. Anyway, while we're on this subject, I'm completely lost about the use of these brackets up top. Again, the holes don't quite align up to drives or anything like that. So let me know in the comments if you have an idea. The inner set is 71 millimeters center to center, and the outer set is roughly 108 millimeters center to center. As for two and a half inch drives, there was a sign of hope. So if you were to use this thing where it was originally positioned, you'd unfortunately have to sacrifice your RAM, CPU cooler, and most likely the 24 pin motherboard power connector, since while you could fit this bracket back in with all those in place, there's just no way you could have a, a two and a half inch drive protruding into the main compartment. It, it's just not compatible. And I was gonna say, however, you could still use it in the rear compartment if you don't use a graphics card and probably a three and a half inch drive. It, yeah, it, I don't think so. It's so tight on clearance to the side panel. I, I just don't think it's possible. You might need to shave off an edge of it or something. Moddable, but not by stock. Anyway, this is all academic at this point since there are so many conceding factors at play. I didn't end up getting it back in there since it was such a clash fest. Missed function number one.
I thought this couldn't take any two and a half inch drives without the bracket, but it can. Going back to the base of the case, there are two holes and those holes are perfectly sized to accept a two and a half inch drive. So you could install one on the main compartment side with the motherboard by the side of the power supply unit. But if you have a lot of excess PCI Express riser cable, then you may encounter a bit of force pushing against the card and that's not great when there's only two side screws into it so be very mindful of that but there is an option for a drive at the base. You either go with one of two setups, an onboard GPU system with extra storage or a dedicated graphics card system with no extra storage. Speaking of which, the graphics card install was... yeah. So, I was pretty confident I'd be able to reuse the Thermaltake Peace Express riser that came with the Core P3, that's the test bench, but it's not quite long enough at 25 centimeters stem to stern. So, I had to buy a riser, and the only one that was readily available within a few days and not over a week was this Link Up 40 centimeter Peace Express 4.0 riser, which cost me 90 pounds. I don't need a 4.0 riser, and I don't really need it to be 40 centimeters. 35 would have been perfect, but 35 centimeter cables are either rare or they just don't exist. And the Lian Li riser that was cheaper would have taken just too long to get here. It would have meant that this would have, the whole video would have been a week overdue. So for the cheapest case I've ever reviewed, it's somehow become the most expensive case I've ever reviewed. And I reviewed the torrent. Compact. Anyway, rather than dwell on that, let's put a not entirely comfortable amount of bend onto the £90 investment to make the turn to fix onto the posts provided. I wasn't happy with this setup, as try after trying a few routing options, the best way I was able to make this bend without getting too uncomfortable was to remove the board and loop the riser through the slots in the motherboard tray to allow it to snake into position. I probably don't like it any more than you do, but it did work and allowed me to move on. On that note, the hole spacing. So we are roughly speaking, probably about 10, 10 centimeters short, double back five, about 10 centimeters short. Um, so this cable itself is top to tail, about 25 centimeters on the long side. So realistically, you're gonna need probably a 35 centimeter cable um, and on the other side of that if you say had a uh, riser and you were thinking you're going to reuse it uh, these thermal take ones that come with the core p3 do not line up properly you can get one hole lining up on one side but you are about half a centimeter off on the other so it doesn't really matter where you put this it's not going to work you need to get a PCI express riser with the correct spacing Roughly speaking, center to center is about 113 for the larger standoffs. Smaller, that's about 130. Um, whereas the ones with the thermal take are 107. So they are a smidge off, yeah, about half a centimeter off the 113-ish. So anyway, yeah, reusing these, no good. So yeah, make sure the riser you're looking at is compatible first before pulling the trigger. As far as I can tell, there's no standard for this, so just take the measurements of roughly 113mm for the inner set of standoffs and roughly 130mm for the outer standoffs, and I'm sure you'll find something suitable. Risers with slots rather than holes are available, so lean to those if they're around and you are really unsure. I'll put an Amazon affiliate link or associate link, I suppose to call them, in the video description, which you can either buy through, and, and I'll learn through qualifying purchases, or you can just use it as a reference to buying something else. My quick review of this cable is it works. As for installing the graphics card to the installed riser, it was a clash fest, but the installation of the card into the riser itself was straightforward. Clearance wise you've got up to 90, 190 millimeters of space but that doesn't take into account maneuvering the card into position so I wouldn't recommend going for a card much longer than the 1060 superclocked or SC in here which is 173 millimeters long. I'd also recommend going for either a blower style card if possible or a side exhausting card so out the 
side or top and bottom relative to this case. Uh, this one exhausts to the front a little, or the front a little, uh, and to the rear, which likely hinders its performance since the main exhaust is up top. Onto cable management, it's exceptionally hard in this case, as it is with many tight ITX cases. So getting back to the graphics card situation, you may have picked up on it before if you were eagle-eyed, but I had to undo all the preemptive cable routing that I did just after the power supply and installed to get the card in, and then reroute the cables to suit the card. This was time consuming and kind of painful, but it was necessary. I did a lot of work on this off camera, but there was also a point where I removed to never return the USB 3.0 ports because there wasn't enough room. One of the selling points of this super cheap case had to be removed for the sake of difficult cable management, so obviously that's not going to score very well. Fortunately, there is a fair amount of room above the power supply unit to store excess cables, but what there wasn't enough room for was my NZXT grid fan controller. Granted, it is a big one, but I do need it to be able to flexibly control the fans for acoustic and full speed testing. When I say there wasn't enough room, I did first off camera squeeze it into the top, but it blocked so much of the vent, the system overheated with CPU package temps of over 100 degrees Celsius. I think I saw 106 degrees, uh, but I didn't have it on camera. So. I had to work around the case and I ended up removing the Peace Express side plate uh, and routing the power and USB and fan cables through the gap so that the grid was more of an external fan controller uh, than an internal one. The last point I'll make before dragging this section out too long is to highlight that since the motherboard 24 pin power cable is thick and relatively unbendable, it w it's a cable, it's bendable, but for a cable, it's not that bendable. It was pressing on the side panel when closing up the case. Just another offshoot of just such a tight case. Normally I'd go into the manual and parts box at this point, but there is no manual and there is only a bag of screws and a couple of cable ties and these pads. In hindsight, these are probably pads to support the back of the power supply unit, but there's no way I'm adding those in at this stage. Now for the part we've all been waiting for, and personally my favourite part of the review process. The acoustic and thermal performance testing and analysis. You can find the hardware used in the video description, not affiliate links, they're just all the hardware for testing and information purposes. In terms of the thermal setup, since there aren't any positions for case fans, we're just relying on the L9 or L9i, NHL9i CPU cooler to intake and exhaust vertically, and likewise we're asking the same from, from the graphics card. Now, because this is such an unusual case, there are some slightly different testing parameters than what I would usually do. Normally, the graphics card and CPU cooler fans are locked throughout all testing, uh, that's the acoustic and the full speed testing, only the case fans would change, and they would be set, or they are set, to a total system output of 36.5 dBA at 40 centimeters on the test bench. That's where I've grabbed the figures for their locked speeds. For the L9i, that's 60% fan speed, and for the uh, 1060 uh, superclocked, that's 30% fan speed. It's a very noisy fan. Now, since there's no room to add case fans for full speed testing, instead of ramping the non-existent case fans to full speed, the L9i's fan was set to full speed to make the system more stable. Even on the test bench, the L9i causes the system to crash under normal testing. Uh, so yeah, it, it needs good airflow provided by say some case fans to survive testing. Note that the room temperature was anywhere from 26 to 30 degrees. 28.9 now uh, when it was being tested, so not ideal for testing overall, but especially not ideal for a case with no case fans. Even even one case fan is extremely important. I genuinely genuinely would think about modding one into this if I bought this for a full permanent setup. Anyway, as for the acoustic testing where case fans would normally be limited in speed to output a total system noise level of 37.5 dBA, the L9i was set to its normal testing speed of 60%. So all completely back to normal testing for the acoustic testing. But since the Flex ATX power supply unit was so noisy, the system was still outputting 38 dBA, 0.5 dBA over the noise target uh, at the 40 centimeters at 45 
uh, degrees from the front of the case. So those were, are the two main testing concessions that I had to make. Let's go over the results. The script wasn't entirely clear whether that was the end of the sentence, so apologies. In the full speed testing with the GPU at normal testing speed and the L9i cranked up to 100%, our super cheap U110, U110, U11, what am I calling it, U110? U110. Our super cheap U110 didn't do very well. All temps taken into account, it's 22% hotter than the NZXT H210i, which only came with one 1400 RPM fan. Although I have tested the ITX system in the O11 Dynamic Mini, which is a much larger case without case fans, and that was about 8% cooler overall. Taking a look at the stats page for this testing and our super cheap U110, even though it had no case fans, was the loudest case of them all. Remember the H210i had, uh, had a 1,400 RPM, 120 millimeter fan running, and it was still three decibels or dBA quieter, which is significant. Now, bear in mind that the H210i was large enough to take the largest side Mugen 5 test cooler, uh, so it was getting better cooling overall. Instead of having a single CPU cooler to test all cases, something I used to do, I actually have a few test coolers of different sizes uh, to fit the largest cooler into each case, since that's a little more realistic. Think of it as a holistic cooling system rather that, that includes the case, rather than just a case being the only component of the cooling system that's changing. Um, normally, well, with fair testing, you change one thing each time, one element each time. Um, I'm lumping in, say, the CPU cooler uh, as one of those elements. It's just normal. You would fit in the largest cooler you could or the best cooler you could into any case you get. Um, so yeah. To add some context to that, I used to test with a with the 37 millimeter tall NHL 9i that you see in the video now. I used to test all cases like that with that cooler. Unfortunately, that means with some cases, it's beneficial. In others, it's actually a detriment to the capabilities of that case and what it's offering. A case that ha that can take a 160 millimeter cooler will perform very differently with an L9i compared to a case that can only take a 30 millimeter cooler, and one has a huge disadvantage over the other. So realis realistically speaking, you are going to go for a more suitably sized cooler to suit your case because it makes the most sense. So, yes, it's technically not strictly sticking to fair test principles, but also uh, a lot more parameters than just the case are, are changing when you change a case. The volume of that case is a massive impact on that, uh, and that in itself means that the airflow characteristics change entirely, which then means that it's it's not just the case changing. It's not just uh, one thing changing. There are so many parameters involved that... Um, capability of the cooler that you have also changes and it's understandable that you would fit a larger cooler in a larger case and a smaller cooler in a smaller case but what we're trying to do is find out the best potential that we can get um, within fair testing principles and by that I do noise normalized testing and apart from this one case all of the fan speeds are locked to noise normalized testing parameters based on the open air test bench uh, so yeah it's a little complicated it's more complicated than it first appears but uh, i'm doing my absolute best to give you the essentially best case scenario within testing parameters so yeah some some people still won't get it um and and i still struggle with it sometimes but i think this is the best i can possibly do um to give you the best you can get in terms of uh testing statistics. Regardless of that, most of the noise in the U110 system is coming from the 40mm fan of the Flex ATX power supply unit that's working hard to output the system at full tilt. Moving on to the acoustically normalized testing, as I said before, the U110's power supply unit was so noisy it couldn't meet the 37.5 dBA noise target when the CPU cooler and GPU fans were at their testing speed, which is 36.5 dBA on an open air test bench, which is not a speed, it's a noise output, but you get what I mean. So it's noisier, and even after some cheating, it's 20% hotter than the next 
hottest case. Now, it's worth noting that this case is nearly five times smaller than the pretty small H210i, and I should and do need to test some other super compact cases to see how they fare in comparison. But it's worth understanding that this design and others very similar to it, Flex ATX power supply in it, no case fans, etc., won't be far off this performance. Now we're past the performance, let's quickly tot up the rest of the factors and come to a final conclusion and score. So this is the total score breakdown sheet, and you might not be surprised to see the U110 at the bottom. Starting with the specification score, if you're new to recent reviews on this channel, I have a spreadsheet set up that has roughly 300 cases and all their main specs are stored. The spreadsheet then rates each component's compatibility against the volume of the case, and then each of those scores is rated relative to the other 300-ish cases to get a 0 to 10 rating for each component. And that's what you're seeing on this graph, the volume and market weighted compatibility score. And despite the lacking fan and radiator support, the sheer minuscule size of the U110 means it's still competitive on a specification compatibility side of things. Now, that's not quite the end of the specification score since I lump in a bonus score for included case fans. This is a very work in progress and I think it needs some nerfing, but since the U110 doesn't have any included case fans, it lags behind those that include many, and even many large fans like the Torrent Compact in first place at the top. Brushing past the thermal performance score, the U110 did very poorly, but it wasn't an outright failure. The build quality is also quite poor with the U110, but the breakdown shows that the panels and chassis are well rated, nice and sturdy, but the finish and drives are poorly rated. Note that not all zeros are counted, you know, not all the zeros are counted. Uh, some scores, like like the glass panel are marked as not applicable, that doesn't account to the overall score, but the filters and three and a half inch drive cage are scored at zero since they're non-existent and zero effort respectively. 29.2, installation ease, and yeah, it's a tight ITX case, so it's always gonna score a little low. Based on my table of issues that cause point deductions, U110 rates are especially low on the power supply unit and cable management factors. Now we come to the final tally of scores. It's actually more of an average of the factors, the different factors. But anyway, the U110 gets a total of 3.3 .3 out of 10. But since you need a, well, it did get a 4.3 out of 10. But since you need a very specific power supply unit that's not readily compatible with many other cases, and you need a PCI Express riser cable that doesn't come with the, with the case, and costs a lot, this forces you down a very specific pathway and is misleading in the initial cost of the case, if you're looking to use a PISA Express card anyway. So the U110 gets a penalty point of 1, or minus 1, and I've only ever really awarded bonus points for things like the three included rear panels of the O11 Dynamic Mini, so this is the first time a penalty point has ever been re awarded, not rewarded. Anyway, it seems very fair since this factor isn't accounted for in any of the other scoring parameters, so there we go. Now onto the price and price versus score. The cost of this case, as mentioned in the introduction, is roughly $32, which is less than half of the next cheapest case that I've reviewed in the last year or so. So when we combine the price with the total score, the ULN U110 does rather well. Would I recommend the U110 over something like the H210i? No. But then again, this score, or price versus score, is considering the price of the case is $32, which it isn't actually, because it's not truly functional as we reviewed it with a graphics card or other PCI Express devices at that price level. So, you need a PCI Express riser cable. Let's, let's say you get a relatively cheap one, a 40 centimeter riser for say $60, which brings you to the total price of $92, which when we combine with the score, sends the U110 into last place by a long shot. And honestly, as cute and fun as this case looks, if I was recommending something between, say, this and the Fantex P200A, another ITX case, albeit a bigger one, for $70, I'd have to recommend the P200A. If you want to know more about that case, then click on the card to the top right now. But Cliff notes it has really solid thermal performance and has a filtered intake and comes with a couple of fans. ARGB no less. Final thoughts on this case, 
It's all right, but it's not as cheap as it seems due to the necessity of an extra PCI Express riser and the Flex ATX power supply unit you need more than likely means that you're transferring, that if you're transferring your existing system into this, you'll likely need to buy one since you likely don't already have one, likely. And or if you are building a new system in this, you probably won't end up using that power supply unit in other cases since it's a bit of a rare form factor at least for now. Granted, it could become more popular, but since they're not, since they're so noisy, I wouldn't count on it outside of being much more expensive models, you know, that are either quieter or fanless. But since half of the point of this complaint is overall cost, it won't be a big factor if cost isn't a big factor to you, in which case you'll likely find something more suitable with a higher price tag anyway. Well then, if you made it this far, I've been trying to cut down videos, especially ones about cases that aren't very expensive or are very cheap since there's less riding on them. But I can't seem to help myself. And hey, if you have a smaller budget, it doesn't mean you want to know less about what you're buying. So I'll just keep doing what I'm doing and see what happens. Please consider supporting all of this on Patreon like these guys have. I'll update you all on the madness that's been bogging me down from working on the channel over there soon. Uh, thank you for watching this one, everyone. Take it easy, and I'll catch you in the next one. Uh, yeah, support me on Patreon if, if you want to. Um, uh, yeah. 29.2 uh, was the, the final temperature.